You're listening to audio recorded at Mount Air First Christian Church. For more resources or to contact us, look us up at www.mountairfirstchristianchurch.org. First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 19. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Verse 17. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The grass withers, the flower fades, word of our God stands forever. This morning our passage is requiring us to talk about this one little dirty word here, halfway through verse 17, about judgment. Uh, that this Peter is taking a, a, a turn, he's We've gone through this beginning section singing praise and honor and glory to God for his great salvation, all that he's done for us. And then Peter begins to turn the corner into all that that actually means for us on the ground with the statement of be holy for, for I am holy. And then he backs it up with this idea that, that there is a realization going on in the life of a Christian that God in who he is is a righteous judge and therefore as people who call him father who judges impartially we ought to live with fear during our days of exile now you can imagine that if you're trying to preach uh, faithfully to the emphasis or the ethos of the passage there's some weightiness some heaviness to this passage judgment but before we get bogged down, or maybe you get bogged down in the seriousness, the weightiness of this, I, I could summarize, I think, the passage, or the idea that is coming out of this passage this way. And it is simply that your life matters. What you do matters. That right now counts forever. And I've stolen that from Ligonier, the, the publishing company that does our Table Talk magazine. One of their slogans is, right now counts forever. This life matters. Your life matters. What you do matters. We are not just skipping along, filling the days, just passing the time. Your life matters. Who you are, what you do matters. Right now counts forever. There is a weightiness that the Christian realizes. There is a weightiness to this life. We are not passing the time. When it comes to church, I hope we, we are not here to play church. This matters. Life matters. We're not, we don't gather as families to play house. We, things matter. Life matters. Your life matters. What you do matters. Right now counts forever. And so that's the big idea. We'll return to it. But Peter, he goes on into this call to be holy by realizing this word, this reality of God as judge. The idea of judgment, the idea of judging. We have almost an allergic reaction to it today. Like it's a dirty word to say something has been judged or you've been judged. It's, it has this real negative connotation. And so the world just almost 
by nature, instinctively, when we talk about judge, we, we think it's uh, uh, something bad happening. But the reality is everyone in the world at all times is judging. <laughs> it is a reality that we live in that we all at various times in various ways are looking at things and saying, this is right, this is wrong. This is good, this is bad. You know what that is? That is judging. That is saying, okay, this is a, this is a right thing to do. This is a wrong thing to do. You know, you find out that even if you play flag football with a bunch of kids, even they have a sense that they're judging the game. This is a right thing to do. This is a wrong thing to do. It's, it's hardwired in every one of us. We cannot escape the reality that we, by nature, make judgments. It's inescapable. We really should slow our roll. We really should back off a little bit on the judgment on the, the, which because it's judging, on the, the negative stance we have on people who make judgments because that's all of us. <laughs> Welcome to humanity. We are all constantly deciding good, bad, right, wrong, looking at other people and saying right, wrong, good, bad, looking at our own lives, looking at our own options and saying good or bad. The question should be about what has informed those judgments? Why good? Why bad? Why right? Why wrong? Is it just myself? Is it just whatever? Why? Why good? Why bad? But that's not where we're going to go this morning. Instead, why is humanity wired? Why is it universal? And I think you probably could go back in anthropological studies and look at cultures throughout history and they all, at some level, have judgments. They all say right, wrong on various activities. This is good, this is bad. Why in every culture throughout history do we have a code of right and wrong? Why is it just intrinsic? And the Christian, we have an answer to this question. Why every human being is hardwired with an ability and an, inst an instinct to look at things and say right, wrong. We do this because of our doctrine of man. We realize, we confess that mankind is made in the image and likeness of God. And there's a fancy Latin term called the Imago Dei, or some people say the Imago Dei. I always say the Imago Dei, which is Latin for the image of God. And we can go back to Genesis 1.27, where it tells us that God creates mankind in his own image and likeness. We are made in the likeness of God. Humans, yes, have a distinct re role in the universe, God creates us distinct in his image and likeness. We are separate from all of the rest of creation. Humans, homo sapiens, we uniquely are those who are made in the image and likeness of God. All of humanity made in his image and likeness, therefore has intrinsic value and worth. No matter their Skin color, no matter their sex, no matter their worldview, no matter their religion, no matter their prejudices, at one very basic level, God commands us to value every life from the moment of conception to the last breath they take. It's said from the womb to the tomb. Because we are in the image and likeness of God, we value every life. We value every, every individual because they are made in God's image. Now, what that means, being made in God's image, is that we bear his characteristics. We bear, he, we are in his, we are representatives of God. We bear and reflect his characteristics. Now, we don't have time to go through the reality of the fall that God's image is broken or marred or, or clouded over, that because of the sinfulness of man, we are no longer perfect representatives of God. Something has broken. Sin has entered the world. And so we do not mirror perfectly God's characteristics we, because we are not, Peter has to tell us, be holy as God is holy. If we were perfect mirrors of, God's, of God, if we were perfect image bearers, we wouldn't have to be told that we would be holy, but we are sinful. That image is broken. But what remains is, in the sense of judgment, what that is, is a reflection of our God. 
He is. The reason why all of humanity looks and says good, bad, right, wrong is because we are reflecting, mirroring the reality of our God. And he is a righteous judge. He is a God who says right, wrong, good, bad, yes to this, no to that. And the reason why it's pervasive throughout humanity is because we are in God's image and that is who he is. God himself is a righteous judge who has a standard and he declares our various activities right or wrong. He has no uh, board he appeals to. He doesn't ask a counsel of whoever. Is this good? Is this bad? God, things are good because God says they are good. He is the ultimate judge. He is the ultimate judge. He isn't he a jury. He is the board. He is the jury. He is righteous and good. And good is good not because God agrees with it, because God actually says it's good. He's the definer of good. He is the judge. That reality is where Peter goes with his letter. He calls the readers to live lives of holiness, reflecting the holiness of their God and their creator and the redeemer. That, that title that he gives God. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. So there's a lot of conversation. You can pick up all kinds of books on eschatology, the end of time, and how this is all going to play out. And you can read uh, lots of different scenarios, timelines of how this goes down when, the, when Christ returns. I hope you were listening there in 1 John and hear the similarities even of 1 Peter and 1 John, this appearing, the Christian faith is longing for the appearing of the Savior who's going to set all things right, who's going to reveal all things at the end of time. But you can, how that all lies out and, and what the role of works will be in the life of a believer at the final judgment, it's very interesting. You can read countless different understandings by people much smarter than me how this will all play out in the future. But that there is going to be a reckoning of the works that we do does seem clear from Scripture. You can turn with me to 1 Corinthians uh, this is a passage that is wrongly um, uh, uh, thought of as uh, uh, purgatory by some Catholics. This is not what Paul is writing about. If a Catholic ever brings up this passage and tries to defend purgatory from it, that is not what Paul is writing about. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he is talking about this end day when Christ returns and what's going to happen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved but only as through fire. Jump down to verse four, verses one through five. I mean, Paul, it's interesting to hear him like take so seriously. I mean, you know, this is the, this is the preacher of the gospel of the grace of God. This is the guy who writes Ephesians, for it is by grace we have been saved through faith, not of works so that no one can boast. Like don't confuse Paul with some sort of a works righteousness or work salvation guy. He's not. But listen to what he's, listen to how these two would come together. Chapter four, verse one. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. You probably could think of a parable from Jesus on such things. But with me, 
It is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. I, and in fact, I do not even judge myself. Oh, we like the sound of that. We like that one. I don't care if you judge me. I don't, we, we go back to Tupac. You know, only you can't judge me. I don't care if you judge me. I don't care if the world judges me. I don't even judge me. But he goes on. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. How this plays out in space and time, whenever Christ returns and that we are caught up in the joy of our Father. And there's that passage I love in Revelation where he wipes the tear away from everyone's face. And we are entered like the, the, when he says the, with a parable of the talents, each one when the, when the master comes back and they bring their talents. And he says, enter into the joy of your master. Amen. I love that. That's, I'm all in. But there is this reality that Peter is talking about, that Paul talks about, that something along these lines, uh, and along these times, is going to be sobering for us. Is going to be sobering for us. What is the only conclusion from these passages? What, Paul, what Peter has said here, live, conduct yourselves sober-mindedly, preparing your minds for action. Why? Because your life matters. What we do matters. Right now counts forever. Your actions matter and will be accounted for. Kill sin when you see it. When, when it is brought to your attention, an area of your life is sin. When anger is pointed out to you, whenever you are unfairly judging someone, whenever you have a standard that God does not approve of, whenever you're breaking a Ten Commandment, we're talking about uh, the Eighth Commandment, do not steal. When, you, when your eyes are open to a way that you're stealing from your neighbor or whatever, kill sin. Then get on it. Why? Because your life matters. What you do matters. Kill sin. It's nothing to be toyed around with. There's an attitude among some that, well, we know sin is bad. And we know we all do it. And so, you know, who, it's just a reality of life. And so therefore, yeah, you sin, I sin, we all sin. Uh, let's just kind of smile and walk along. That is not what the Bible talks That is not how it regards sin. It regards sin as deadly, as enslaving, as that which sends you to hell. <laughs> and so thus it is to be taken seriously. The biblical argument is the attitude from God's word is that no work is ever unknown by God. We have catechism question. I think it's Keech's catechism. Um, but it talks, it, one of the, the question answers that it goes through is, can any, what is, who is God? God is spirit and has no body as we do. And then can you see God? No, I cannot see God, but he can always see me. <laughs> no, I cannot see God, but he can always see me. And I read that with my kids. I'm like, ooh, gosh, that is, that's serious stuff. Because what's that saying is nothing's hidden from him. And we ought to take that very seriously. And so Peter encourages the church to live like it matters. If you call him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Your life matters. What you do matters. Right now counts forever. And there's only one judge. And it's before him that we stand. And we ought to take that seriously. Peter says people of God ought to live their lives without fear or with fear throughout the time of their exile. It's a call back right to the beginning of the book. He talks about the elect exiles. Those who are exiles or sojourners. As we are living in this world, not of this world, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, but this world living in it, not our final home, we ought to conduct ourselves with fear. What does it mean then to fear God? And typically we jump back and forth between, we don't want fear to be terror, like you're terrified of God, like you're, you're just absolutely uh, mortified, petrified, paralyzed with fear of God. 
And we say, oh, that's, that can't be that kind of fear. And so then we say, well, fear is more just like, oh, well, we, we revere him. We think highly of him. We kind of think highly. And, it kind of, and it's a very passive fear. Like, oh, yeah, I think he's really great. But basically inconsequential. And that is not what the fear of God is looking like. I, they're both of those things rolled into a healthy unity. Um, can, can that exist a, a healthy fear and a healthy reverence? I think so. I mean, you think of driving a car. Uh, we, we all, a lot of us, sorry kids, drive cars. But with your kid, don't you want them to have a healthy fear? Because a car ride can go really bad really fast, right? I mean, it can end your life in, in, in a blink of an eye. So you better have a healthy fear when you drive a car, that when you meet a car on the highway, on the interstate, when you're trying to stay awake, you better have a healthy fear against falling asleep in a car. You better be at one level afraid of driving. The minute, I mean, we've all seen them, the high schoolers going by and they're, all, they're reading, they're, they're texting somebody or browsing Instagram. I don't know what they're doing, Snapchatting. As they drive their car, they've lost fear. That's bad. We all know that's bad. When you lose the fear of something that important, it's bad. But there also is a, a, a reverence can not, not exist at the same time with this reverence, like this enjoyment of, yes, I have a healthy, it's not a paralyzing fear, it's a respectful fear, yet I have to have that held in tension. And what's incredible is that Peter himself in this passage marries both of these things. To see God as Father, which is incredible, that those who were at war with God could be father, could call, him, call him Father, and yet to conduct ourselves with fear, living lives in obedience to him. There's some legitimate fear that such discussion will turn us into legalists. Um, boy, just so many rules. And isn't this just... Uh, overly critical and, and, and overly legalistic. And there, there are those who will take teachings like this and turn them into, now, because God, your life matters and you need to try to live for him, that they'll take those things and turn them into tests for salvation or turn them into qualifications for salvation. That it's as though it is the works that we ought to care about and be doing by which we are saved that's not Peter's thinking. He puts both realities. As obedient children, since you call him father, means we are his. We're not earning our salvation. We're not trying to get to earn to call him father. We call him father, yet still we live lives of obedience as obedient children, knowing that he judges impartially. That both of these things are put forward. If they call him on him as father, they are to then live out of a reverential fear that will seek to live, live lives that are pleasing to him. He grounds the entire call for obedience and holy living on what? He says, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing what? You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited by your forefathers. And this ransom came not with perishable things such as silver as gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. How does the Christian live? Not trusting in their own works or looking to them as some kind of salvation. No, we trust Jesus, the forgiveness, the work of his blood that redeems us, that forgives us, that cleanses us from all sin. Jesus lives the righteous life we should have lived but failed to do, dies a sinner's death on a cross, taking his people's sins upon himself so that every one of us this morning, every person listening to this, turning from their sins and trusting in Christ is made righteous in God's sight, redeemed, ransomed out of their futile ways, made a part of the family of God, forgiven of your sins. That's good news. And then, because if you call on him as father, then calling him on father, live now in reverential fear to live lives that are pleasing to him. He grounds the entire call for obedience and holy living on the blood of Jesus. Knowing that we live our lives in awareness, not asleep, sober-minded, seeking to cease from sin wherever it presents itself in our lives. Do you ever sit down and take a personal audit on why you're doing what you're doing. What are the motives behind the things that I'm doing? 
What motivations propel you? What are the things, the activities that take your time? What do you give your life to? What takes away the hours of your days? And what are the motivations behind why you do what you do? They matter. It matters. Who you are, mat- your life matters. What you do matters. This part is important. They matter And there's only one final judge. They matter before one person more than anyone else. At the end of the day, you won't stand before me. You won't stand before this congregation. You'll stand before him. You'll stand before him. And so it is important. We must conduct ourselves with that awareness and fear during our time here. Thankfully, graciously, this judge has not left us in the dark on what he expects from his people. He has given us a book full of how to live before him, what holiness before him looks like. We could generally summarize it, love God, love neighbor. Now there's, that's spelled out, that's fleshed out in many ways throughout this book. Love him, love your neighbor are two big categories. He spelled out further definition of what living in obedience to those commands looks like. Therefore, we ought to be resolute in our pursuit of him. So we hear Peter say in Acts chapter 5, he says they get in trouble, all the disciples, and they say, you got to stop talking about Jesus. And Peter says, we must obey God, not men. Because he knows that there's one judge. There's one person that he stands before. This is, the, that's what, this is what he says. And, and so we have to take it seriously. And also, we have to take seriously what he says, this book. And also, God graciously puts us in a church family. He puts us with brothers and sisters who we're able to live life beside that have perspective different than us that are able to say, here's an area of your life you might want to think about. Here's an area where you're wandering off into sin. And God graciously puts us in discipling relationships with the body of Christ, the family called the church, that we might be ushered lovingly. It's called discipline. And it's a good thing because it ushers us to straighten our lives before this God who it really matters. And it ushers us to to live our lives in ways that are pleasing to him. It is called discipline and it is a good and gracious thing. Not pleasant at all times, for sure, but pleasing to God. If it's pleasing to him, then it is a very good thing. We must be resolute, but not without rejoicing. So we try, this has been pretty heavy because... I think the passage talks about this reality of we need to live conducting ourselves with fear. But he does end with this reminder. You've been bought with the precious blood of Christ. He's redeemed you from your futile ways. Why do we want, why live to glorify him? Why live to be a disciple and to make disciples? Why live a life that honors him? Because he has rescued you. He has made you his own, not by the things that you do. He has made you his own by his own grace and mercy. He sent his son to take your sins upon himself that you might be redeemed, forgiven, and made his own, not by any merit of yours. Because in light of that glorious reality, in light of that glorious reality, conduct yourselves with fear before him, with reverential awe and respect Because your life does matter. We must be resolute, but not without rejoicing. We live for him not to earn a place in his family, to be able to call him father, but we live because he has made us family, because he has told us through Christ to call him father. Your life matters because Jesus ransomed you with his own precious blood. And because he has, we are not our own but now live for him, for his glory and his purposes in the world. Let's pray. Father, I I ask that you would impress upon us, God, the joyous seriousness to this gospel life. That, Father, the good news of what Christ has done in redeeming us purchasing us with his own blood. What good news that is to know that 
the sins that I have willfully committed, the transgression, the rebellion that has filled my life, God, looking forward and knowing, God, that apart from your grace, the the former passions that will still pull upon each one of us as we continue to walk out this life, yet knowing that because of your steadfast love, love you redeemed, let the redeemed of the Lord sing with joy because what you have done, God, help us to see it. Help us to Find our joy in it, God, so that, yes, when we walk out these doors, God, we enjoy, live resolute lives. You have bought us. If we call you Father, like Peter says, if we call upon you as Father, you have bought us. You have made us your own. And Father, we want to have lives then that matter and that glorify and make much of you. That Father, at the end of all time, we talked about this this morning, We know that ultimately, if we are washed by the blood of the lamb, we enter into your joy. And what a glorious reality that is. And Father, may that hope, that joy, that peace, that good news fuel us to live our lives, not for ourselves, but for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.